short video on applying and creating geometries in the Globe Clarity Seismic Processing software. Uh, this is particularly focused on land surveys and works with our geometry application to apply 2D, 3D land uh, CDP geometries. Now, Claritas can read survey information that's used by land data sets in a number of formats. Um, the ones I'm going to focus on initially when talking about using the geometry application is the SPS format because that's um, fairly typical for most surveys to be available these days. Um, so if, if you're on the geometry tab you can see there are two buttons for the geometry application. There's setup where you can choose the type of data you're reading in or one that's specifically set up to read and utilize SPS data. So I'll click on the setup from SPS and it brings up a, a parameter form where we can supply information about the data we want to read in. So we're going to read in an input files and that's going to be our receiver position information, our source position information and the relations file that ties together the sources and receivers um, and defines how they're related to the shot ID numbers in the trace seismic trace header and the channel number in the seismic trace header. Uh, we're going to call it video test as the line ID and we're going to use the Claritas um, 2D land tutorial data set as the example we're going to work from. Um, Claritas can read both SPS version 2.1 which is the latest version and SPS 001 which is the original SPS format that was um, defined. Um, we can basically state that this is a 2D line or 2D survey so that's what we're working on and then everything else we're going to leave to default but there's a number of ways we can control data reading in. So if I click OK and we get a bar graph showing progress and then a new pop-up which gives some information about the data that's been read in on the summary of the contents. So it gives us information about receiver peg range, uh, easting, northing and elevation ranges on those receiver pegs, shot pe peg range, easting, northing, elevation um, ranges and also the total number of receivers or shot pegs present and then also shot ID range, channel range, uh, min max receiver range and maximum number of channels per shot. Uh, if we're happy with that we can click on continue and we get another pop-up message just telling us that the geometry database has been created and that we will still need to define a CDP geometry using 3D grid or 2D wiggly line gather before it's actually binned into CDPs. So we click OK or continue and it brings up a map interface showing basically the data for peg locations um, and their elevations. So the pegs are elevation coded since the change in colors along here which correspond to the bar, color bar down the bottom here. Uh, so now we've got the data into the geometry application we can run some just check on a few things so we can click on the info button uh, we can look at the geom file header and it'll pop up a window that will give us some information about the data set again a lot of it's replicated from what we've already seen in that little pop-up window uh, we can look at peg information and again it'll basically bring up a number of adjacent pegs uh, easting and northern min maxes, elevations and distances. It is that. Or finally, shot information. So if we click on shot information, it brings up yet another pop up uh, which shows us information about each shot ID, um, gives us trace numbers, uh, receiver pegs in that corresponding to the trace, min or the offset for each trace, azimuth for each trace. Um, easting, northing, and if it's been binned it would show the CDP trace. And I can basically then at any point down the line I can click on a location and it will bring up that shot ID, closest shot ID. It will highlight the receivers that are live and that shot's being fired into and then show or display the information in the pop-up window. So that way we can go along and QC the information that's been read in, see if we're happy with it. And then once we're comfortable with what we're seeing um, in there and through choosing to, to draw any further information we want to, so we can look at, um, can turn off elevation colored pegs if we wanted just to show the peg locations. We could draw shot positions in, which we read 
squares to see what's going on. And we can also draw trace midpoints if we want to see how the traces scatter around those sources. Uh, once we're happy, uh, we can then look at how we want to bin it. So for 2D lines, there's two choices. If it's a relatively straight line with a little curvature, we could use the linear CDP gather and we don't need to define hit points. It'll just push a straight line CDP gather down the line. Or if we think there's enough curvature in there, which this one probably just has just about enough curvature to warrant it, uh, we can apply a crooked or wiggly line CDP binning scheme to the data. But to do that first, we need to pick hit points. So if I click on the hit point button, uh, we can manually pick hit points if we want, but really the, the automatic picking is very robust. So I'd recommend in most cases to use the automatic picks. And so we click on make automatic picks. Uh, default is for 40 hit points. Um, for a line this long, you can probably make it fewer. And for a very long line, you might want to make it more picks. Uh, so we click OK. And you can see it's now popped in those hit points down there through the middle of the trace midpoint scatter. Just for ease of viewing the data, we're going to turn off trace midpoints. Uh, click OK. And then we're going to go to the Make button and click on Wiggly Line CDP Gather. And again, we get another pop-up window. So the output geometry name is taken from the line name we've given the data when we've read it in. First CP is going to be on CP100 um, because of the source receiver increments which are 10 meters uh, we're getting a normal CDP spacing of 5 meters. Uh, we've got a maximum fold set at 90 which should be suitable for this data. We can use curved or straight segments. We'll de use the default curved. We can have rectangular or circular bins and again we'll use the rectangular default option. Uh, bin size long line, we're going to slightly overlap each bin, so rather than being bang on sort of half the CDP spacing of 2.5 meters, we're going to set it at 3.5 to allow some overlap to make sure no traces fall in between bins if due to the slight curved nature of the, the bidding scheme. There might be small gaps between each bin location. And then we're going to increase the perpendicular bin size to 100 meters so that no traces are lost because they fall outside the bins in that perpendicular sense. And we're going to click OK. And again, um, what you may notice if you're quick enough is you'll see it defining percentage complete up around here and whether it's binned data. Uh, and then we'll have a, a list of the fold. So how many, how many bins have a particular fold down the line and on this case we've lost one trace out of all the traces we've been so we can try and chase down why that is so we could click on the draw button um, click on lost traces click OK and see if we can identify where that lost trace is uh, might need to turn off some of the other things and we're looking, so we've got one there, so it's probably still, even with three and a half meter over that, there might be one trace, one trace or one CDP bin where there's enough gap that a trace is falling between it. Um, so we're not worried about that, but if you had a lot of lost traces, you could possibly re-bin the data to make sure you didn't lose those traces. Um, and then we can look at some other QC, so we can look at... Um, draw and say look at aerial fold distribution to see how the data folds like along the line etc. So a number of QCs in here where we can confirm that the, the line's looking good. We can click on CDP information um, and then click which brings up another window so we can then click anywhere in the thing in the line and it'll show basically the CDP at that location and the uh, shot ID channels and source and receiver pegs that are uh, binned into that CDP. Once we're happy with the CDP binning, we can then basically do the final part of the processing within the geometry application is to define uh, the floating datum statics. So click on that. Again, another parameter form appears. So we set our fixed datum at just above um, the maximum elevation of the line. 
we have a replacement velocity that's suitable for this line at 2300 meters per second 149 point filter and we create a new file called float cdp shift uh, continue so you can see we've got a quite a smooth profile and compare that with uh, elevation profile as it's acquired and you can see that we're quite a well, nice smooth profile but it should help our processing uh, to be corrected to that sort of smooth datum make processing all easier um, we can quit and discard that right, so now we're happy we have can leave the geometry application um, we, can, we can quit and just have it written to the geometry database that it's um, created and then apply use a job flow to apply it or if we're using HDF5 data sets as our internal processing format which is what we recommend we can save it directly into the save the geometry directly into a seismic trace header of an existing data file so just having to rewrite a file um, to merge the geometry so we can select our file which in this case is this 96-08 geom fb shots and click OK and it's saved that geometry into the HDF5 headers file quit um, we can also as I said run it as part of a processing flow and so we could use the 01 merge geometry job and that's going to read our raw seismic data in um, add geometry so pick up our geometry database that we've created merge that in and then write out a new data set into their our project directory so that's um, using geometry application to create a cdp geometry and apply it to a data set um, using sps files um, the other option that's quite useful is if you're you've reformatted your segd data and from that SEGD you've managed to extract the source and receiver XYs, the elevation coordinates and shot ID channel numbers into the seismic trace header. If you've got a HF5 file we can read that directly into our geometry database and set up geometry based on that information from the trace header. So we can basically if we go to SizeCat highlight the data set we want to work on, right mouse button click and then we can select build geometry and it will launch the geometry application so it gives a little warning about saying there's nothing in there that defines whether the spins are circular or not if there's CDP geometry already there and brings up the geometry application and then we can work with the data in exactly the same way as we have um, when using the SPS file so I won't go through that again because it's the same process quit out and then the other options are to use um, if you've got ASCII text file that aren't SPS format, we can create SPS files, so the SPS, RPS, and XPS files, or Claritas specific internal .sir and OBL files that can be used to launch the geometry application um, and apply CDP geometry. 3D CDP geometry applications, very similar. Again, it uses the geometry application. Uh, but in that case, rather than hit points along the line, we basically define a, a 3D grid based on either hit points along one inline um, or origin location and XY coordinate and azimuths for inline cross line direction. But very similar, so using the same application. Um, and then if you need to go back and check anything in terms of the geometry, we have a query application which allows you to read in a geometry database or HDF5 file or JOM file um, and run some look at the information in the, the geometry database header look at shots etc and check it through and then once you've applied the geometry to the data you can then basically use the SV application to run your standard um, geometry QCs around overlay offsets etc uh, to confirm that the geometry has been correctly applied um, and that about covers it. Any questions, do let us know.